company Sodium City, job title CEO. And thanks for joining us today, everyone. I'm Arpina Kocharian, leader and gaming analyst with UBS, and we are really excited to have with us oh, for a fireside chat Chris Cox, Chief Executive Officer of Hasbro, and Cynthia Williams, President of Wizard of the Cost and Digital Beautiful. Gaming, and Debbie Hancock, Head of Investor Relations at Hasbro. The focus of this call is going to be Hasbro's franchise brand, Magic the Gathering, and Hasbro's long-term strategy for its gaming business. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> but before I go any further, as an investment analyst, I'm required to provide certain disclosures relating to the nature of my own relationship and that of UBS with any company on which I express a view on this call today. These disclosures are available at ubs.com slash disclosures, or please reach out to me and I can provide them to you after this Do you call. Has, bro? Also, there will be no discussion of any confidential, restricted, or material non-public information on this call. This is only a 30, 40 minute call, so we might not have time to open the lines for Q&A, but feel free to send me questions by email if we don't address them on the call. Uh, with all Hi. of that out of the way, Chris, Cynthia, Debbie, welcome, and thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having us, Arpine. Thanks, Wonderful. Arpine. It's great to be here. It's great to thank be you, here. Thank you, Debbie, and I, and I know you need to read some disclosures before we begin. Is that yeah, I, also, I also have to do a short disclosure, so um, thank you for having us today. Um, just before we begin, I want to remind everyone that That's we may it. make just some the forward-looking overview. statements. Okay. Our management team may make forward-looking okay. statements concerning our expectations, goals, objectives, or similar matters, and that there are many factors that could cause actual results or events to differ materially from the anticipated results Hell or yeah. other expectations expressed in these forward-looking statements. Proof there are symmetrical. And the factors are in our annual report on Form 10-K, our most recent 10-Q, and other public disclosures. And we have no undertake no obligation to update any forward-looking statements made today to reflect events or circumstances occurring after the date of this web. Obviously, unprecedented times, middle of a global pandemic, Don't supply chain give challenges a and disruptions. Fuck when you started with Hasbro. Forward. Shut Could the fuck up. Uh, Wait, who asked? And, uh, be able to share a little bit of insight on the company, and particularly one of our favorite brands, Magic the Gathering. Um, I think Cynthia will have a, a wealth of information to share on that. Gaming wait, 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 wait. You know, where I, I think the big points on um, the pivot on the strategy are in a couple areas. First off, we're shifting from a, a bit more of a breadth strategy with our old strategy to be more focused on the depth strategy. We call it fewer, bigger, better brands. What is Hasbro that? has a what? You know, where I, I think the big points on um, the pivot on the strategy are in a couple areas. First off, we're shifting from a, a bit more of a breadth strategy with our old strategy. A what strategy? I don't know what that means. I, I don't know what that word is. What? I, I don't know. I, I don't know what word he's saying. To be more focused on the depth strategy. First off, we're shifting from a, a bit more of a breadth strategy with our old strategy Brett? to be more. We're shifting from a, a bit more of a breadth strategy with our old strategy to be more focused. Distance measurement from side to side. I uh, I broke it. <laughs> I broke it. <laughs> we're breaking shit. Entertainment strategy. How how is that different from what that strategy was before? Hasbro has over 1,500 IP in our portfolio, and we're really going to focus in on about uh, eight to ten brands and really grow them. And those brands are going to be in places that we have a lot of strength as a company, gaming being a big one, where we believe we can be the leader in the category, where we can drive above category growth, okay. and where we can drive first of a all, really nice profit. First of all, okay, hold on. <laughs> Before I say anything stupid, let's go through all these games that they are confident. Here, let's let's get where we where we can drive above category growth and where we can drive a uh, really nice. Okay, so they think they can be the leader in the gaming category. G nobody knows any of these games. The game doesn't exist, game doesn't exist anymore. Game doesn't exist, game doesn't exist, game doesn't exist, game doesn't exist, game doesn't exist. What have they done? This, this is not a full list because it's missing Magic Arena and MTGO. It's, it's missing every single Watsy thing. Okay, the point is, the point I'm trying to make, I was trying to get <laughs> proof of, is that they think that they're going to be a digital leader of sorts in the gaming industry, or they think they can be a leader. Profiles, where we believe we can be the leader in the category. You're never going to be a fucking leader in any type of digital space with the type of bullshit that you do. Nobody in their right fucking mind is even going to touch your company. You're going to have zero sponsors because you have zero digital assets anywhere. 
You don't care about content creators. Not a single large content creator is even going to fucking touch you. Every big content creator that even touches your game, nobody fucking knows who they are. Not a single fucking person. You go to any gaming industry, you go to any gaming, you go to TwitchCon, anywhere, a dream hack, and nobody knows who any of these people are. The only person you have going for you is Post Malone. His cock is so deep inside your throat that you forget that there's other people out there that are trying to promote your game and you're just completely fucking ignoring. I don't know if anyone has heard of a game called Among Us. You had one person, one streamer that made that game popular <laughs> and it fucking blew up everywhere. You had soda popping. That's all you need. One really big streamer with a lot of influence. And where we can drive uh, really nice profit profiles over the mid and long term. The second aspect of the strategy is a focus on the consumer and really doubling down on our consumer insights, on understanding our consumers, and then also how we communicate with our consumers, increasing our A&P budgets, uh, driving new and innovative experiences with the consumer. aspect of the strategy is a focus on the consumer and really doubling down on our consumer insights, on understanding our consumers, and then also how we communicate with our consumers increasing our A&P budgets, uh, driving new and innovative experiences with the consumer, surrounding them with uh, you know, a host of engagement opportunities, whether that's big budget movies like we have with the upcoming D&D Honor Among Thieves movies, or great video games like we have with Magic the Gathering Arena. Oh, shut the, the fuck up. Magic Arena has had the same fucking bugs in it for four years. You have so much built up technical debt, you have no fucking idea what you're doing at this point in time. You put a billion dollar company in the hands of 15 dog shit developers, and now you're pretending that you're some leader of the gaming industry? You're fucking delusional if you think you have any foothold or any grasp of any type of community within the gaming industry. You're actually fucking mind boggling stupid. I unbelievable, Strategy unbelievable. It's been like, two minutes on discipline really driving incremental operational excellence as a company so that we can pair the fantastic creativity and design we have with you know a stronger cost management and we believe that we're going to be able to accrue significant value of that in october we talked about a goal to generate 250 to 300 million dollars of cost savings annually over the next three years we believe we're on track to do that and potentially even exceed that and, you know, I think that's just good business, whether or not it's healthy economic times or more challenging economic times. It will position Hasbro to be able to invest in our brands and deliver more cash to shareholders. Okay, that doesn't... I think when you put it all together, what Blueprint... So you're trying to get more savings in your company so that if it fucking fails, you can pay out your investors. Year to date, it's gone down 40 fucking percent. Just because you have savings doesn't mean your stock is any more valuable. It means nothing. 2.0 really is, is it's a redoubling and a refocusing on our traditional mission of play. You know, Hasbro is going to celebrate our 100th anniversary next year. You know, we have this portfolio of amazing brands, and we've built those brands through play, starting as early as the ages of two to three. Who asked? And extending on into adulthood. And Blueprint 2.0 puts no our one focus cares. squarely on our biggest brands with our best consumer insight and driving a little bit more discipline uh, to pair with our great innovation and creativity. Fantastic. That was great for opening, Chris. Um, thank you. Uh, Cynthia, you know, as Chris mentioned, Hasbro has a strong gaming portfolio unparalleled really in the industry, making up a significant portion of profits for the overall company. Could we talk about um, your largest brand, Magic the Gathering? Um, and could you start by giving us a brief overview of where that business is today? And then I have a quick follow up for you, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, thank you, Arpane, for having us. First of all, it's my pleasure to talk about Magic. It is really an amazing game with an incredible fan base. Uh, Magic was created in 1993, and it's the world's first trading card game. Been okay. played by over 50 million players to date in over 200 countries. The gameplay is highly strategic and customizable to any individual's play style. Players take turns. Let's go land destruction. Against each other by casting spells, summoning creatures, and using artifacts that are depicted on individual cards that the player draws from their personalized deck. 
Uh, Magic also offers multiple formats of play, which determine the types of cards or the number of cards a player uses in their deck. Some of those formats are more competitive and some are more casual, which offers a wide variety of endless game gameplay. This options. is the most obvious script read I've we ever seen in my life. New cards through <laughs> uh, expansion sets multiple times a year. And there is really nearly a limitless combination that players can use to suit their different play styles. And that all leads to a very high level of customization by the player. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Cynthia, when we, when we think That's about- That's fantastic. Hospital, we frequ <laughs> we frequently you. think about kids, but magic is not typically played by kids. What can you tell us uh, and people on the call about the magic player today and how that has been evolving. Sure, uh, we know a lot about our players. Uh, multiple times a year, we survey tens of thousands of Magic fans on a variety of topics related to the game. Uh, the Magic active tabletop player on average and? is 30 years old. Uh, players range from about 13 years old to over 45. Uh, I think it's important that, to know that one third of our players have less than three years of experience with the game, and another third has been playing for more than 10 years. Uh, and so you end up with this wide range of engagement. We also look at how and why. Okay. This looks good right here. One third of your player base has been playing more than 10 years. The thing is, is that when you have eternal formats, so the cards you bought when you're 10 years old or the ones that were given to you, technically you played at that point in time. Then if you find them 10 years later and you just start playing with your friends again or whatever for nostalgia, boom, you're part of that one third. It's not really indicative of how active those players are or how important they are or how much money they spend. It's just a bullshit number that they're trying to throw out there to impress their investors. Uh, we've seen growth in casual players who we estimate represent about 80% of the player base with the competitive player representing the remaining. You know, and this single insight has really led to a major rethinking of our offering and how to serve. It's crazy. It's almost like competitive play is important. Our growing and more diverse player base. Players mm. and fans participate across multiple segments and they overlap. Uh, for example, in the casual segment, the format that's most popular and played by more than 70% of our players is a social format called Commander. Uh, it's played by four players at a time, and it has a really unique and cooperative rule set. And we do specific product releases to maximize this fan engagement. Over half of our players identify as social players, meaning uh -huh. that they enjoy four players at a time, and, and the fans participate across multiple segments, and they overlap. Uh, but for example, in the casual segment, in the, the format that's most popular and played by more than 70% of our players is a social format called Commander. Okay. So the most popular amongst casuals is Commander. And then they said 70% of players total play Commander. Why would you phrase it that way? Uh, it's played by four players at a time and they overlap. Uh, but for example, in the casual segment... Weird. The format that's most popular and played by more than 70% of our players is a social format called Commander. Uh, it's played by four players at a time, and it has a really unique and cooperative rule set. Okay. And we do specific product releases to maximize this fan engagement. Over half of our players identify as social players, meaning that they enjoy the game for the social experience. And about 50% are collectors of some kind, whether it be buying the cards for a themed commander deck, strictly for aesthetic purposes, or as an outlet for self-expression through their gameplay. And finally, I'd say we have over 10 million re registered digital players with Magic Arena. And in the past Registered means nothing. Active players means something. And then you have to identify what active 
means, okay? Like, if you played MTG, right, back in 2010 or back in 1995, you saw Magic the Gathering Arena and you're like, wow, these graphics look awesome. I am super hyped to play this. It's free, sweet. Most likely you're gonna sign up for MTGA just to give it a try because it's free and it looks cool. It's the best looking Magic that's ever played and it's free, right? There's so many plus sides. Most people have quit MTGA, but they're never gonna give out that information. They're just gonna go over total registrations. <laughs> they're gonna say, there was 10 million. There's only like 1 million active <laughs> with this. Two years, our fastest growing category of Magic players are the hybrid players, meaning they play on both digital and tabletop. And this group tends to have the highest satisfaction rates with the game and the highest level of spending. In fact, they spend 40% more than the average revenue of Magic players across all expressions. That was just great. I don't think I've ever heard this much of good color on kind of the player profile. So this was super helpful. Thank you. My I have so many questions. What do you mean? <laughs> it's not helpful. It may, it, I have more questions. I have way more questions. There's 80% is casual and 20% is competitive. H how do you identify a casual and how do you identify a competitor? You got rid of DCI. Is casual somebody who's never entered in a tournament or is casual somebody who's entered in, in a tournament once in the last 10 years? My next question is for uh, both Chris and you, Cynthia. Um, Chris, you were leading Wizards until earlier this year. Could yep. you talk to us about how you- Congrats that on business? that promotion, so Chris. Yeah, one of the key questions I get on Magic is that after an incredible run of four or five years of above average growth and arena rollout, that business is much bigger today. So if you were to recap what's next for Magic and how you grow that business going forward, because every gaming company uh, on investors' minds saw uptick during COVID and now seeing the reversal of that, why could MTG be different and how you intend to grow that business uh going forward okay how do we intend sure. so I'll, I'll start off so um sure so I'll, I'll start off so um you know magic has been gosh i would argue one of the biggest success stories in the games category over the last probably decade i was fortunate enough to start in the business in 2016 after the business had grown i think for seven straight years uh we had started to see a little bit of a plateauing in that growth in 2014 and 2015 and so we started to kind of really kind of understand, okay, why was that? Mm -hmm. And in 2016, when Magic, you know, was probably around 350-ish uh, million dollars, maybe 400 million dollars at that time, uh, we really had a monolithic view of the player. We thought there was one player; it was the competitive player, and uh, we knew that there were other player segments that existed, like casual players and collectors. But we honestly were a little afraid uh, that if we built products that deviated at all from our traditional approach of appealing to the, co the competitive player, that we would hurt the business. And what we found uh, was actually the opposite. Um, if we were able to segment our, our player profiles in just really simple ways, so call it the competitive player, the social player, and the collector, and uh, build products that were bespoke to each of them, Okay. We could make that each of those segments happier. We could engage them more. Uh, we could get more of their time and you know more of their, their share of wallet and grow the business as a whole. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you know, over that you know intervening six six and a half year period, we've probably either tripled or come close to tripled uh, the overall Magic business. And we've been able to do it across a wide set of products, um, a wide set of segments that have made the business healthier than ever. Um, and we've been able to do it in a fairly balanced way where we've been able to balance new player growth with lapsed player reacquisition because there's probably like close to 60 million people in the world who have ever played Magic. So actually people coming back to Magic is just as important to us as new players who've never played it before, as well as driving okay. a little bit of revenue growth per user through that. Again, Returning customer acquisition is great, but returning customer acquisition retention 
is more important. That segmentation approach. We just don't know what that is. For us, and it's been good for our channel partners, uh, whether that's hobby stores, mass stores, or e-commerce partners like Amazon. Right. Haven't you been dumping yeah, all your I products on Amazon, agree. which has been yeah. fucking the LGSs? Yeah. I'd love to talk about a little bit about our plans to continue to grow Magic, or am I crazy? especially in 2023 and beyond. And I will say we do have some good tailwinds that are aiding us. Uh, primarily that we are seeing this bold return to in-person play. You know, Magic really thrives bold on that return. face-to-face interaction that wasn't able to happen during mm-hmm. the pandemic. Our in-store play participation numbers are trending up, and they're already back to about 75% of where they were pre-pandemic. We recently organized the largest ever in-person event in Magic's history. We had over 10,000 players Mm -hmm. gather in person in Las Vegas uh, to kick off our 30th anniversary celebration. Which, by the way, is fucking pathetic. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. 30 years the biggest fucking anniversary you've ever had you were advertising it for a year straight and you only got 10k people it was such an you see more people than that than yearly gaming tournaments they're saying it like it's an impressive number 10k is actually fucking pathetic for something like magic Dude, this is embarrassing. How would why would you even say that number? Event. Uh, and we plan on having four more of those Magic Con next year. Our first one will be in Philadelphia mm-hmm. on February 17th through the 19th. You know, we've been releasing six tent pole sets uh, for several years. We'll do that again in 2023. Uh, with our new player acquisition strategy focused on the universes beyond line. Uh, this year, we have the Lord of the Rings as a big tentpole release. And we also have smaller sets like Doctor Who uh, that will attract in new players. In future years, you'll see us do the same with Final Fantasy and Assassin's Creed, which will join the franchise. And of course... We- see, the best things about these collabs is that they're this close to being full mobile game they're this close no one cares about doctor who and transformers and magic yeah but it doesn't matter if the cards are good then it doesn't matter it doesn't matter to anybody because casuals will like it because they like doctor who they like transformers they like whatever they just like that stuff they'll collect it collectors will get it because they're collectors casuals will like it because you know some casuals watch doctor who competitive players will like it if the cards are good full stop doesn't fucking matter we'll be celebrating magic's 30th anniversary with our fans um the magic cons i mentioned uh we'll be releasing new products and we're especially excited to help our trade partners and our fans by offering exclusive promo cards from each year of Magic that will be available exclusively through our Wizards Play Network, Network stores with every tentpole set release. You know, Magic is wait for than- every what? Be available exclusively through our Wizards Play Network Network stores with every tentpole set release. Oh, it's actually tentpole. Oh, okay. It is actually tentpole. That is what they're saying. Wizards tentpole marketing is the yeah, like this. With that being the event, actually, it's probably rather. It's probably closer to this. It's almost more like a water slide. <laughs> fan event uh, and we plan on having four more of those magic cons next year okay. our first one will be in philadelphia on february 17th uh, with our new player acquisition strategy focused on the universes beyond line uh, this year we have the lord of the rings as a big tentpole release and we also have okay. smaller sets like doctor who uh, that will attract in new players so, in years, you'll yeah, Empaz are just collabs, which will join the franchise. When you're only Empaz are collabs, it's like, Magic's 30th anniversary with our fans. but I guess um, it's the, the only way to do it. Uh, we'll be releasing new products, and we're especially excited to help our trade partners 
and our fans. To be fair, the only way they can really make money is to get 100 developers to make a new fucking Magic Arena client that doesn't have five years of technical debt that actually has four-player commander capabilities and go from there. A brand new Magic Arena client because you know that the current one fucking sucks and the original 15 people that built it were under a ridiculous time restraint and they just didn't have the knowledge or wherewithal to do anything that they needed to do. By offering exclusive Stupid brainless from each year of Magic that will be available exclusively through our Wizards Play Network, Network stores with every Temple set release. You know, Magic is bigger than it's ever been. It's on pace to become Hasbro's first billion dollar brand. And our surveys show that our net promoter score globally has increased to the highest point it's been at in the past three years. The only reason it's becoming a billion dollar brand is because all the dumb fucks that were in crypto are now the dumb fucks that are investing in magic. Don't at me. Thank you. That's very helpful. I think maybe this is a question for you regarding Arena, which has been a, obviously a huge success. Um, I remember back in the day before MTG digitization, you know, the big pushback or concern for investors was whether there was. My programmer? No, I'm just familiar with the industry going to be cannibalization of that business once you go. I could be a project manager. However, I would never work for Watsi because they're too fucking... I would never work for Watsi because I would be embarrassed to have them on my resume, especially if it was Magic Arena, as should every programmer. Digital, and now we know it was actually additive to the business. But my question is, is there more... However, unlike the current developers, I would actually organize and put together petitions and talk with the bigger players and the bigger streamers to be like, hey, I need your help organizing to find out exactly what's wrong with Arena. We need to fix shit. The thing is that management isn't listening to us. So we need to make sure that everyone gets together and figure out what the issue is so that we can present it to management and then they allow us to fix the issue. Either that, or they just need to go to management and say, hey, this is a problem. We have to hire people to fix this issue. Now, granted, you can't just go around and hire 50 people to fix issues. It doesn't work that way. That's not how it works. You would have to slowly trickle it through. They have like 50 developers right now, at least the last time I checked, which was like earlier this year. If they wanted to start hiring developers to just fix all their shit that's broken, first of all, they couldn't do that. It's just, it's just they can't fix shit. They would have to do one, maybe two developers at a time, wait like six months and then keep doing it. However, I'm assuming their turnover rate is also relatively high. It's probably around the... 50% rate every year. I guess maybe that's not super high, but it'd probably be around there. It would probably be around there if I were to take a guess. Um, engaged and they spend the most. So our efforts around Magic Digital will drive increased play and integration across both tabletop and our digital platforms. Now, Wizards Play Network happen with stores Blizzard? are telling us that they see new players coming into their store who are ready to join that community <sighs> after they learn to play Magic on Arena. Uh, so yeah. Magic the Gathering Arena has been a great uh, success for us, but it still has room to grow as we continue to invest to meet the needs of that wide range of players. So in 2023, mm -hmm. Arena will refactor our new player experience to improve onboarding for new players and help them quickly find the play experiences that appeal to them the most. This will reinforce our acquisition efforts and maximize the impact of our launch on Steam to improve onboarding for new players and have, uh, success for us, but it still has room to grow as we continue to invest to meet the needs of that wide range of players. Mm -hmm. So in 2023, Arena will refactor our new player experience to improve onboarding for new players and help them quickly find the play experiences that appeal to them the most. This will reinforce our acquisition efforts and maximize the impact of our launch on Steam, uh, which is the biggest gaming platform in the world outside of mobile. And it will be our largest platform expansion since our mobile launch last year. We'll continue okay. to engage. Uh... It's going to be really, really good. Okay, so what's going to happen is that every account is essentially going to be forced to go to Steam, I believe. So you're going to have to download Steam in order to do MTGA. 
which is great because you know what's awesome on Steam that a lot of people actually pay attention to, even though a game may be free. So this is what you get. Yeah, it's great in terms of player feedback. People legitimately look at this because when you go to the reviews, you see if it's recommended, you see how many hours are played. So you see this person recommended it. They have 32.8 hours on record for this game. And then at the time of the review, they had 30.3 hours. You can see how many hours exactly. Like this is amazing reviews. So once Arena comes to Steam, people can make these reviews and they're gonna be forced to look at it because you can't disable reviews. It doesn't work that way. This isn't YouTube. You can't disable comments. I'm really, really excited for this. New players and longtime Magic players with our expanding product releases and our event offerings, uh, including our first digital Universes Beyond set featuring Lord of the Rings. Uh, we've seen really great engagement with our premier play launch this year, and 2023 will see our first full year of Arena Championships and qualifier weekends, as well as our increasingly popular arena opens. The only reason they're increasingly popular is because it's the only avenue to actually qualify for the paper tournaments. Like This is a completely irrelevant statement. The thing is you're leaving out important information that you need to actually give to the investors. You're giving bullshit stats and you're just like pandering to them. I mean, obviously that's what you're supposed to do. But anybody who has a fiber of a fraction of a brain cell who actually cares about anything other than money can see the future of where what's going on it's gonna be bad steam might make them fix it right um i think steam is going to be really beneficial to them because they're going to get way more downloads on steam because there's going to be a ton of advertisement put into it they can get on the front page relatively easy it's a huge company it's hasbro right really popular game magic the gathering they could get up here it's gonna be a free game everyone has heard of magic the gathering like everyone right so people can be like oh magic the gathering awesome it's free awesome people will download it they'll look at the reviews most likely it'll say average people will download it what they're gonna do is they're gonna say we launched on steam we got record downloads, but they're going to completely leave out the retention of those people. They're going to completely leave out what the customer feedback was. They're going to leave out all of the important stuff outside of the unique downloads. We made all these new accounts, but all those new accounts were created because you forced people to make brand new accounts coming from your normal client to Steam. It's like fake numbers. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Chris, maybe this is a question for you. You know, inflation has been top of mind for investors and ability to take on pricing also has been important. And we have seen um, kind of more traditional toy sector take on pricing throughout yeah, the Yeah, inflation's past, crazy. The That's why really. we're charging but $250 as, as for a pack kind of proxies. Price elasticity of demand for magic. If it was In real mind, cards, least, we would have charged more, but, you know. Less price elastic customer versus a kind of more traditional toy consumer. First, do you think my assumption is correct? Second, do you believe pricing along with unit growth could drive magic over the next couple of years? Yeah, you know, I, I think just the, the straight answer to your question is yes, it, it tends to be a less priced elastic customer, but, you know, obviously there's logical limits to that. Um, you know, we're very aware across our business of the pressure. They probably won't show hours play priest. Yeah, they probably don't even track it. There's so much information that they just don't share with the uh, with the public already. So I don't even think that they record that information, to be honest, as far as hours played. I just I don't think they do, um, which means I'll probably just leave Magic Arena open on my computer for like days. I'll probably leave it open for about four months straight just so I can leave a bad review. <laughs> ...that the general consumer is under and the general discretionary pressure. The discretionary sector is under... Great game, horrible client. 
Uh, we have taken some pricing actions across our lineup at Hasbro. And, you know, this year we took a pricing action on about half of the Magic line. Uh, the first time we've done that in 10 years. And, you know, we're very reluctant to do that. Uh, you know, we've got a great brand. We've got a great product. Um, the, the challenge that we've had is there's just been a lot of cost buildup inside of the general paper market. Uh, yeah. Paper pulp is more expensive, significantly more expensive than it's been over the last Which it was. years. Yeah, and, and that's very true. Trade. That is true. The paper products in general, just paper, paper, just paper, not necessarily paper cards, but paper in general, that price has gone up. So what they did is they increased the price a little bit earlier this year. I forgot exactly how much, but I want to say it was like 10 cents a pack or something like that. So it wasn't a ton, but it was a little, and they're like, oh, it's the first time we did it in 10 years. The thing is, is that the actual card quality has also gone down. So if the price of paper has gone up, you're going to increase the price of your packs. That makes sense. However, when the quality of the paper that you're charging more for to go in line with the price of the paper is going down, your price shouldn't go up. If the cost of paper goes up and you decide to have shittier paper to compensate for that, then your price should stay the same. But again, information they're leaving out. Trading card market, whether it's kind of fantasy or gamified the trading cards like magic or more sports oriented trading cards have seen explosive growth. So there's a fair amount of printing press um, uh, demand uh, that drives up uh, some cost pressures. Now, mm -hmm. all that said, you know, when we look at how we think about growing magic over time, um, you know, Cynthia would be the expert at this, but I, I don't think it's about raising prices on magic cards or raising prices on magic packs. At the end of the day, it's about growing our player base, and it's about add and it's about leaning into our segmentation strategy and adding products that our players want and have a lot of play value and collector's value. Mm -hmm. And I think Cynthia and the team have been doing a, mm. a very adept job at that. You know, certainly we have some of the best experts in the company driving that for us. Great, and that's actually a good segue to my question for Cynthia, which is then why are you focusing on only Post Malone? That's the only thing you're focusing on. 80% of the players are casual players. The most popular amongst casual players is Commander. However, 70% of total players play Commander. So hyper-focusing on Post Malone makes sense, right? Makes sense. 100% makes sense. Yeah, they're just like deep-throating him for days, right? They're licking his asshole it's it's fine it makes sense thing is is they're completely ignoring the other 30 percent and the reason or to compensate for completely ignoring the other 30 percent and this 20 percent is they're fucking them more just by increasing the prices of everything else and lowering the quality you know if it isn't price are you releasing then more product this year could you sort of go through pillars of growth for magic um and if you can briefly address dnd but then we'll get back to dnd in a bit but um if you would just sort of go through kind of those pillars of growth as you see for magic and i'm sorry some of this could be a bit of a repeat of what you said early cynthia <laughs> absolutely fine. how many pillars um, do we have you know our growth is coming from both our customer and product segmentation strategy which is backed by a lot of the data and insights in the magic's different fan bases uh, we have the information you won't share with anybody more in the last four years than we did in the prior 26. Um, and as a result, we're serving more player segments than ever before. And so there's been a okay. shift. Experimenting more in the last four years includes just Magic the Gathering Arena. And the increased group of people you just mentioned is only Magic Arena. You're literally just self reporting. Who is falling for this? And how many skews? we release in a year. So for example, we've been on a cadence of six temple releases a year for over three years now. And there are major releases that have the most to offer every kind of magic player. With each of those temple releases, we have expanded the number of booster product types to meet player preferences. There are major releases that have the most to offer every excuse we release in a year. So for example, we've been on a cadence of six temple releases a year for over three years now. And there are major releases that have the most to offer every kind of magic player. 
With each of those tentpole releases, we have expanded the number of booster product types to meet player preferences, including adding set boosters and collector boosters. And then we'll have smaller print run products sprinkled between those tentpole releases that are opt-in, uh, depending on what type of player you are and what resonates with you. So we have a collectible product line called Secret Lair, and we do some smaller sets like Infinity that fall in that category. But if I were summarizing it, I'd say our growth has come from monetizing more player segments and not just from increasing the spend of the same core set of players. And our product release schedule really reflects that. 26. So six tent pole releases for over three years now and some smaller products sprinkled in between. 26 minus six. Because if there's 26 products, you're going to minus six because the six main tent pole. So there's 20 products left. I'm not great at math. That's why I have a math emote. Okay. So the six tent pole releases are 23% of your actual releases. <laughs> I don't know if sprinkle means what you think it means. Say that in the second half of 2022, we had a really compressed release schedule that was partially driven by supply chain issues. Um, we don't intend, we will not schedule tentful releases this closely together going forward. Um, the supply chain issue I referenced resulted in two micro sets releasing. Just to inform investors of the direction of the company, sort of a financial forecast of the company, finances and products. On the same date in October. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the supply chain issue I referenced resulted in two micro sets releasing on the same date in October. Mm -hmm. um, but in 2023, we will return to our preferred release cadence of approximately two months between our temple sets with individual micro sets sprinkled in between. Uh, you asked about D&D really briefly. I'll say that you'll see us leaning heavily into uh, the expansion of D&D through D&D Beyond, the acquisition that we did uh, that closed this past May. Uh, we'll, we have about 13 million customers, registered users there uh, that we will continue to serve by giving them more ways to express their fandom. Fantastic. And we'll have time, hopefully, if we have time to come back to D&D briefly um, after we are done sort of with magic. But Cynthia, I have a, um, I have a follow up for you. There has been this claim that you're get a real fucking question? too many cards. What is your one sentence, uh, one sentence answer to that, or maybe two sentences? Or whatever. Why does it have to be a one sentence? Two sentences. You know. Yeah, I would love that. Our, <laughs> what the fuck? Why? And our SKUs are print to demand, and this means that we print and reprint products in a set to support players and customers who want to buy it, usually to play with it. And after an initial selling period prior to the launch of a set, uh, all the thing is, is that if you want to stay competitive, even in a casual format like Commander, you have to buy these. That's why people are complaining. They want to stay at least somewhat competitive. So yes, you are going to see people that are buying them. Yes, you are going to see that sales increase, but that's because they're forced to buy them. All reorders after that set reflect real demand. And our average- Oh, is that why we have 58 copies of Duress? Average post-launch sales quantities for our Tentpole premiere set remains unchanged in 20. All reorders after that set reflect real demand. And our average post-launch sales quantities for our tentpole premiere set remains unchanged in 2022 compared to 2021. Um, in aggregate, there is no evidence that magic is overprinted. And the sentiment of magic needs to cut print runs to support prices, that's a misunderstanding of our business and our customers. You know, if our prices for a print-to-demand product rise significantly soon after launch, well, that simply means that we're not adequately meeting customer demand, and we are making millions of players unhappy at their lack of ability to acquire the cards they want to play. Hmm. No, that's really helpful. Um, and and I, 
millions of players unhappy at their lack of ability to acquire. Them. If our prices for a print-to-demand product rise significantly soon after launch, well, that simply means that we're not adequately meeting customer demand, and we are making millions of players unhappy at their lack of ability to acquire the cards they want to play. Hmm. No, that's really helpful. Um, and, and I do want to go back briefly to distribution, Cynthia. With all this kind of player segmentation, what is the primary way you're getting magic product? Uh, with adequately meeting customer demand, and we are making millions of players unhappy. At oh, the people ripping up the 30th anniversary packs? Yeah. That show is funny. Their lack of ability to acquire the cards they want to play. Hmm. No, that's really helpful. Print to demand right. product rise significantly soon after launch. Well, that simply means that we're not adequately meeting customer demand, and we are making millions of players unhappy at their lack of ability to acquire the cards they want to play. Hmm. No, that's really helpful. Um, and and I do want to go back briefly to distribution, Cynthia. They're sounding like the fucking FTX people. Like <laughs> with all the They're just they're not getting asked the questions that actually need to be asked. This kind of player segmentation, what is the primary way you're getting magic product um, into players' hands and how that has changed versus five years ago? Sure. Um, our partnership with the more than 6,000 global Wizards Play Network hobby stores. Nobody gives that a fuck. That is the core sales channel for our business. It accounts for up to 70% of our sales in 22 year to date. And we are really delighted that we can support those passionate local small business owners. Passionate. To provide unique opportunities for our fans to engage in organized play and Wait, hold on. sales kind of did they say percent what is the primary way you're primary getting way. magic product um, into players hands and how that has changed versus five years ago sure um, our partnership with the more than six thousand global wizards play network hobby stores that is the core sales channel for our business it accounts for up to 70 percent of our sales in 22 year to date and we are really delighted that we can support those passionate local small business owners to provide unique opportunities for our fans to engage in organized play and to build community at the local level. I mean, this is really at the heart of our engagement strategy, and it has great benefits for both parties. Okay, what about five years ago? As indicated by our survey data. Every year we carry out a survey among the WPN hobby stores and we collected feedback this year from more than 2,200 of them. Uh, it's a large representative sample, and it gives us a really good pulse on their health. And we're pleased to see that this channel continues to grow, uh, has strong performance. More than 80% of our stores reported that they are growing or equal to last year, and over 60% report growth in their business. Now, over the last five years, we've... Really, 80% of the stores that are reporting to you have been growing since last year. Really? You fucking think? Yeah, how many stores were there before five years ago? Continue to evolve our omni-channel retail strategy. Uh, that involves continuing to expand our footprint at retail globally, e-commerce, as well as our developing our direct-to-consumer collectible offering. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Cynthia, maybe this is still for you. Uh, there has been some chatter, um, kind of secondary market for these cards and that, that values are coming down, uh, because you're printing too much. Is that something that you keep track of? Is, is that something that concerns you? You know, first and foremost, magic is a deep and strategic game that is played in hobby stores, on kitchen tables and online. So our goal is to continue to grow that player base. And as I said previously, we print and reprint products to meet demand from our players. You know, Magic will be our first billion dollar brand this year. And we're growing that brand ahead of the industry and pushing the boundaries of where we can take the product. 
Um, more often than not, we get that right, like our universe is beyond product Warhammer 40K, which is already on its third reap. We get that right. More often than like not. Our universe is beyond product Warhammer 40K, which is already on its third reprint due to demand. And sometimes we step back and we listen to customer feedback, like we did on our recent 30th anniversary edition, where we scaled back the expected supply to assure a great collector experience. Now, that decision might not have been great for us in the short term financially, but it was definitely the right call for the long term health of the brand. And it's oh, you shut the fuck up. You shut the Stop the cat. Cue it. Stop the cat. Stop the cat. <laughs> Are you kidding me? For our fans. And sometimes we step back and we listen to customer feedback, like we did on our recent 30th anniversary edition, where we scaled back the expected supply to assure a great collector experience. Now, that decision might not have been great for us in the short term financially, but it was definitely the right call for the long term health of the brand, and it's good for our fans. Now, we do understand that some players focus on the collectible trading aspects of our product, and we are always thrilled to see players enjoying and valuing our product for years after the initial release. But we don't participate in secondary market activities for magic products, nor do we derive... We don't par we don't participate in secondary drive product and we are always thrilled to see players enjoying and balance in the short term financially, but it was definitely the right call for the long term health of the brand and it's good for our fans. Now we do understand that some players focus on the collectible trading aspects of our product and we are always thrilled to see players enjoying and valuing our product for years after the initial release. But uh, we don't participate in secondary market activity for magic products, nor do we derive any revenue from trading or selling. What we do hear from some of our WPN stores that trade and sell cards after initial sale is- So you mean the only way they can actually make money because you only sell them boxes and they make $5 per box, maybe? You're forcing every single LGS to sell singles in order to make money. What the fuck are you talking about? There's no way you're this fucking delusional. Is that like any market or any other collectible product, God. some products and individual cards do become more collectible than others and values can change over time due to a multitude of external factors, many entirely unrelated to the number of cards printed. Now, we have no indication that there has been any broad negative changes to interest in trading or post-purchase selling of magic products. Mm -hmm. It could be easy for someone who is unfamiliar with our pre-release sales strategy mm -hmm. to draw a negative conclusion about changes in resale values shortly after the release. But the mm -hmm. truth is that magic products are regularly put on sale early, exclusively through our WPN stores, as part of a pre-release program that is designed to encourage in-store play at those stores. Yeah. It is common and expected for the secondary market values for those new products to shift dramatically. Has anyone complained or argued about this? This has been the same since what the inception of pre releases in like 94 or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And immediately a pre release program that is designed to encourage in store play at those stores. It is common and expected for the secondary market values for those new products to shift dramatically mm -hmm. during and immediately following pre release as more products become available in the market. Those value shifts are simply supply catching up with demand. Yeah, I, I do think there's a fair amount of misunderstanding about all of this, so thank you for that. Um, misunderstanding of what? Nobody, t nobody complained about this. Pre-release season, season, no, 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 I don't think, 
there was never a pre-release season. There's always spoiler seasons. Spoiler seasons are completely different than pre-release seasons because spoilers include secret layers, which are not pre-release seasons. It ex- it also includes all MTGA products, which are not pre-release either, which includes also Masters products, which I don't think they do pre-releases for those, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the Commander-only products with the boxes, I don't think those are pre-release either. But I also could be wrong. I meant spoiler season. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's not... Yeah, so... Their pre-release things, as far as I know, hasn't changed in, like, ever. So I don't know who's complaining about that. Or even bringing that up. And I am scanning through some of the questions. Unless I'm missing something. In-store play with our pre-release. What was the question? We have no indication that trading or selling. What we do hear from some of our WPN stores that trade and sell cards after initial sale is that like any market or any other collectible product, some products and individual cards do become more collectible than others and values can change over time due to a multitude of external factors. There's no way store owners are complaining about this. There's no fucking way. They do a pre-release, they get and then sell singles, and then after the product comes out a week later, they're like, oh my god, I sold this card for cheap when it actually skyrocketed in price a week later because it ended up showing in some big tournament or some really popular YouTuber made it in a commander deck. So they're complaining to wizards about it. Like, who the fuck is doing this? Somebody... Like, I'm not an econ major, as we've already discovered, but that's, like, fucking obvious. <laughs> There's many entirely unrelated to the number of cards printed. Now, we have no indication that there has been any broad negative changes to interest in trading or post-purchase selling of Magic products. It could be easy for station that there has been any broad negative changes to interest in trading or post-purchase selling of magic products. It could be easy for someone who is unfamiliar with our pre-release sales strategy to draw a negative conclusion about. Of course. <laughs> Obviously, right? You've like doubled your player base. Of course you're not going to see a negative interest in it. <laughs> I'd fucking sure hope not. <laughs> About changes in resale values shortly after the release. But the <laughs> truth is that Magic products are regularly put on sale early, exclusively through our WPN stores, as part of a pre-release program that is designed to encourage in-store play at those stores. It is common and expected for the secondary market values for those new products to shift dramatically mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. and immediately following pre-release as more products become available in the market. Those value yeah. shifts are simply supply catching up with demand. I yeah, disagree I, with I that. I do think there's a fair amount of misunderstanding. I think a lot of it is this, use. So thank you for that. Um, and I am scanning some of through demand, some of the questions that I've been getting, but use. let me just uh, sort of address uh, one that I also has come up. You know, talent acquisition and retention, I know, has been, uh, and the fact that Magic has to compete with the big tech is something that Hasbro has been pretty focused on as you uh, built uh, those teams. Um, I'm wondering if that has eased a bit in terms of hiring and retention, um, given what's going on in the big tech world. Yeah, you know, we've hired over 350 people this year at Wizards of the Coast, and given the macroeconomic climate, we are also seeing some availability of amazing talent in the market. Uh, and our attrition is low compared with other gaming companies. You know, people want to work at Wizards for a number of reasons. Uh, primarily, they're working on games they love. Our games have incredibly loyal passion. Yeah, I mean, people love World of Warcraft, too, but all the girls started getting molested. That doesn't mean shit. Passionate fans 
who are excited to work on and help shape the games that they've grown up playing. And of course, it's always great to work on a business that is growing and being invested. And, and this is... This is all of Watsi. This isn't digital part of Watsi. Wizards Coast underpays their employees. They don't need more. They actually don't need more. Man. They did, right. from what right. I remember, like four years um, ago, but they don't and need this more. This question is perhaps both for uh, Chris they're like, uh, and. They're uh, slightly higher than uh, average as far as developers, specifically developers. I didn't look at anybody else. But developers, they're a little bit higher than average. And you, Cynthia, um, I was wondering if you could share um, and your that was vision on how as of like you a year ago. D and D monetization and digitization, and how that's going to be different from Magic, and really how you approach that in general. Um, if we could give kind of an overview of uh, that here in terms of what's next for D and D and how that franchise is different from when you were looking at Magic back in 2000, 2017, 2018. Oftentimes, the question I get from investors is, how do you digitize a game that's been around for 50 years, right? Uh, Magic, D&D uh, &D is obviously older than uh, Magic. And, and along with that, perhaps we can touch on how the integration of D&D &D and beyond um, is going, um, growth in transactions or whatever you, you could share. Mind if I start, Chris? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the only thing I'd have to add is every time you talk about the hiring rate at Wizards, I am just absolutely floored. Um, <laughs> you know, my family still lives in Seattle. I live here in Providence, and I, I'll go back to the Wizards offices. <laughs> and it's like I'm a senior. It's like I'm a graduated senior returning the next year to high school, and I don't re I don't recognize half the class. Uh, it's it, it's a, it's a tribute to uh, it's a tribute to that business. Total pay estimate. 149 base pay 124 base pay 124 average base salary 130 okay so they're off by 6k and that's base as in i'm not exactly sure but average is 149 a little bit higher okay so maybe they're not maybe they're not above average anymore <laughs> they were for a little bit oh thank okay. you chris uh you know D, D is has never been more popular and we have really great fans and incredible engagement but uh the first thing i saw with it is the brand is really under monetized uh earlier this year we acquired D, &D beyond and we're really excited about the possibilities <laughs> the platform provides and the positive <laughs> the brand is under monetized your marketing team for D D sucks. How are you gonna make us money off this? Momentum we've already seen. <laughs> we made this acquisition uh, to strengthen our connection to players <laughs> and to power our next phase of product development, user acquisition, and to have live service tools through which we gain really valuable data-driven insights. You know, with DDB, we have a window into how fans are playing the game daily. Even if they're really? playing around the dining room table, many of our D and D fans use Dungeons and Dragons Beyond as a companion app on their phone to make the experience better. And this gives us a look at how people are playing in their homes that we never had before. And so, when mm -hmm. we think about our future monetization, we start here. You know, Dungeon Masters, which are the people. Yeah, milk your magic players now. Go milk the D and D players. Yeah. Hey, getting milked is fun. People who guide you through the adventure. Some they situations. only make up about 20% of the audience, but they are the largest share of our paying players. And for the rest of the players at the table, we believe digital will allow us to offer a lot more options to create rewarding experiences post-sale that helps us unlock the type of recurrent spending you see in digital games, uh, where more than 70% of the revenue in digital gaming comes post-sale. Uh, the speed of digital uh, means that we're able to expand from what is essentially a post-sale that helps the audience, but they are the largest share of our paying players. And for the rest of the players is? on their phone to make the experience better, and this gives us a look at how people are playing in their homes that we never had before. And so when we think about our future monetization, just D&D, right? 
you know, dungeon masters, which are the people who guide you through the adventure, they only make up about 20% of the audience. But they 20%? That's a lot from what I understand. 20% of D&D players are DMs? I mean, first of all, mathematically, that doesn't make sense. But I do understand that, you know, in your play group, you could have a couple people that are DMs and you like rotate DMs. They are the largest share of our paying players. And for the rest of the players... So... Okay, the DMs pay everything. The table, we believe digital will allow us to offer a lot more options to create rewarding experiences post-sale that helps us unlock the type of recurrent spending you see in digital games, uh, where more than 70% of the revenue in digital gaming comes post-sale. Uh, the speed of digital... Uh, Fucking duh. Uh, means that we were able to expand from what is essentially a yearly book publishing model to a recurrent spending environment. And we're offering content that we know fans want. Uh, like the, the highest grossing games in the fucking planet right now. That number is obviously incorrect, by the way. It's like beyond delusionally incorrect. It's like 95 to 98 percent, I would say of the revenue in digital games come post-sale because all the games that make the most money are free. Every single mobile game that makes a fuck ton of money, they're all free. And they make millions of dollars. League of Legends, free. So we're super excited about the top of, type of opportunities we have with D&D to expand beyond the tabletop to reach highly engaged multi-generational fans all around the globe. Yeah, and uh, okay. I think the only thing I'd add to that uh, answer is, you know, if you look at, like, a super simplified view of the strategy of Wizards of the Coast, um, Magic is this super deep single quadrant brand. Um, it does a fantastic job engaging a very loyal and passionate audience. And I think our strategy at Wizards uh, that, you know, Cynthia and the team are really leaning into is, to fuck is them all growing in the ass. that engagement and growing that player base uh, over the next several years so that our new player growth and our reacquired player growth are really kind of carrying the growth of the brand. And you can see that in the initiatives that we're investing in. Wait, what? Like, uh, that, you know, Cynthia and the team are really leaning into is growing that engagement and growing that player base uh, over the next several years so that our new player growth and our reacquired player growth are really kind of carrying the growth of the brand. And you can see that in the initiatives that we're investing in, like uh, expanding distribution of arena growth and our reacquired player growth are really kind of carrying the growth of the brand. Okay, okay, hear me out. They want to fake it, fake it. They want to focus on new player growth and reacquiring player growth, and they want them to carry the growth of the brand. So anybody who currently plays Magic, fuck those people. Nobody cares. That's what this statement just said. No wonder they don't care about any of the streamers or any of the YouTubers or any of the current content creators. That's why they're gargling on the balls of all Commander players and post Malone and everybody just coming out from other places. They don't give a fuck about their current player base. They literally just admitted it in 4K, exposed. Did nobody say anything about this? And you can see that in the initiatives that we're investing in, like uh, expanding distribution of Arena. Steam is the biggest uh, PC distribution platform in the world. It's going to be that such a mistake nice for you. Leg up for Arena. I can't. Uh, I we can't also wait continue for that. to look at other platforms like consoles as another Cannot opportunity for that. for that. And then I can't understate how important Universes Beyond is, and how much uh, early success we've seen in you know crossovers like we did last year with D and D, which at the time was our best-selling summer set ever. Um, and then uh, what we did most recently with Warhammer 40K, which, as Cynthia mentioned, is on its third demand-triggered reprint. Like, we can't keep up with the demand there. And that's just a great way to kind of engage that Warhammer fan base in a very similar, similarly deep and lore-rich game 
and get them activated with us. And we see a lot of upside they, to that. Are they uh, playing the game? with big mega brands. What are the numbers of how many times or how many of the people who have purchased those D&D sets who weren't already Magic players that are now playing MTG? What's the percentage on that? Give me a percentage. It's like Lord of the Rings that we think will be important. And uh, trust me, we have a lot more uh, plans for that and some exciting news that I think we'll be able to share with our fans soon. So Magic's a deep single quadrant strategy. Uh, D&D, d and when I go to cocktail parties and I say, and people ask me, what, what do I do? You know, you know I, what I used to say is, hey, I was president of Wizards of the Coast and they'd say, what's that? And um, I'd say, well, we make Magic the Gathering and then we make, and we make Dungeons and Dragons. I'd have maybe a three in 10 hit rate on people understanding what magic was. But if I did, I would have an incredibly deep conversation and the cocktail party would effectively be over for all other participants. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, or like for D and D though, it was 10 out of 10. Everyone knows D and D. Everyone grew up with it in the seventies and eighties, played the video games in the nineties and early aughts uh, and knows mm. it's a cultural phenomena right now. What kind of cocktail parties are you going to? And so, like, you know, the... The Hasbro cocktail parties? <laughs> the, 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 the D&D strategy, if the magic strategy is a deep single quadrant strat strategy... <laughs> I, don't know a si I don't know a single person in real life that has ever played D&D, &D, like, pre-pandemic, probably. I don't think I know a single one. And I know a lot of people in real life. What is the average age? Uh, it's 30 years old. They talked about it earlier. And I'm 35. So the average D&D &D player, I guess, would be like 50. So maybe I'm just out of touch with the 50-year-olds. <laughs> yeah, I don't, maybe, I'm just, maybe I'm just out of touch with the 50-year-olds. Who knows? I don't know any 50-year-olds that have played D&D. &D. I'm not going to lie. The D and D strategy is a broad four quadrant strategy where we have this powerful brand that has similar awareness to like uh, Lord of the Rings or um, Harry Potter, and we're going to imbue it with blockbuster. Don't get me wrong; like everyone knows what Dungeons and Dragons is, right? It was like a pop culture phenomenon. And by pop culture phenomenon, I mean every single movie that had jocks versus nerds. The nerds always played D and D, and the jocks always made fun of the D and D players. That's the only reason everyone knows what D and D is. Buster Entertainment, like we have with the movie coming up, triple uh, A, true triple A high end gaming, like we're going to have with Baldur's Gate three next year, and then just an amazing set of products that we will activate as Hasbro across our. I didn't know they did Baldur's Gate. Okay, Baldur's Gate is a game. That they did. However, is Baldur's Gate 2. Baldur's Gate was announced two hours ago. August 2023. MTG was also featured in Simpsons. Yeah, MTG was also on MTV as well. Baldur's Gate 1. 887. Okay. So they're like decent games. Our blueprint. Whether that's okay. what we're doing at D and D Beyond, what we're doing at hobby stores uh, with new books and accessories, or what our consumer products team played D and D in high school in 1981 to build Jesus. out a host of new collectibles and toys right. and games. Uh, Maybe for it is more just casual. Yeah. Maybe it's just the what, fifty year olds? Just fifty year olds? Right? Yeah. That. So I you know, I, as excited as I think Cynthia and I are for Magic's growth potential over the coming mid and long term, uh, I think D and D could be a real uh, new leg in the stool uh, for our gaming portfolio as a whole and for Wizards specifically. That was great, thank you. And uh, I promised thirty to forty minute call, but let's take one more question, <clears throat> and that's it. I'm trying to actually scan some questions to make sure I'm incorporating what I'm getting by email as well. Uh, and you already addressed that in some ways, right? Next year, Hasbro has a much better film slate, including the scheduled release of uh, Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves, I think, 2023. 
how do you define success with that film outside of the obvious kind of movie proceeds and upside to that economics? What would it mean for the D&D franchise? How do you define that success? Uh, to me, the the D&D film is the first big light up opportunity for that powerful four quadrant brand. Wait, what happened to the Magic the Gathering Netflix series? Did that come out between summer 2023 and Easter 2024? Okay. You know, the D&D film uh, should, by all accounts, we feel like it's going to have a healthy box office. It's going to have significant marketing. You know, uh, Paramount, uh, <laughs> prior to uh, D&D awareness, we're going to be, act be able to activate that awareness with a host of products at retail, gaming, and online. It's and probably going to do really well then. Um, you know, we're going to follow it up with a host of video games that we license out and work with like great partners like Larian uh, with Baldur's Gate 3 that we develop ourselves. And then follow that up with a host of new entertainment. Like to me, Dungeons and Whatever happened to every single other game that you've made that has failed miserably? Can we get like a real fucking game, please? Dragons is the real poster child for Blueprint 2.0. Our overall corporate engagement story, which is doubling down on play, supercharging play with great storytelling and entertainment, and focusing on a category that we're an early leader in, the best innovator in, and have every right to win uh, and grow our profitability and grow our return to shareholders. So consider me long on D&D. &D. Oh, fantastic. That's a great no to end this call on um, that's a great actually, uh, that's a great minutes. question that nobody submitted so i apologize for that uh i think we're going to conclude the call here thank you so much this was great chris what thank a great you, Debbie, question that so nobody much, uh, for making this possible <laughs> uh, and thanks everyone for joining rpna thanks so much and uh have a happy holiday you too <laughs> thank you thank Bye. you Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you all so much for watching. If you made it to this point, it means you either really enjoyed the video or you fell asleep and I'm waking you up now. <laughs> either way, thank you for all the support. I really do appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this, hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell notification. Come out with videos seven days a week.